Okay, everybody, welcome to Creating our OER with Students. This is our February uh, webinar for the Ontario Open Library Network, uh, which is sort of a community of folks in and outside of Ontario that are using open educational resources that are, are using practices or tools that are found um, through eCampus Ontario supported programs or available in their local community. Uh, so we are so happy to have these webinars on the second Tuesday of every single month. Uh, this is our third one. We're just overwhelmed by the amount of uh, interest that we've gotten. And, and we'll be featuring today three of our Ontario community members who uh, have experienced creating OER with students or as a student. Um, and I'm delighted to have them here. So uh, without uh, me talking too much more about that, I'll just uh, let you know uh, who we have. So in case you can't see them uh, in there in the, uh, the screen, uh, we've got Mel Young here today. She's a teaching and learning, uh, a curriculum developer at the Teaching and Learning Innovation Hub at Cambrian College. We have Cameron Stotts, who's an undergraduate student at the University of Guelph, and Jordan Christie, who's a faculty member in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies uh, at Durham College. Uh, and again, uh, we are doing collaborative note-taking. The link is in the chat. I uh, will drop it in the chat again. And it is also at the bottom of the screen. Um, so we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and let Mel get set up and we're going to go ahead and start with Mel. Um, so Mel, while you figure out how to share your screen, I'll tell people a little bit about you. Um, Mel is a curriculum developer at the Teaching and Learning Innovation Hub. She facilitates orientation in the Teaching Excellence programs for uh, teaching excellence program for new faculty hires. She does course development, in-class delivery, and general pedagogy. Uh, and she's been working a lot with um, open pedagogy um, in her teaching practices by having students create blogs and create an open textbook, which she'll be talking uh, about today. Um, and so today she'll be uh, sharing her challenges and successes with creating an open textbook with her students um, and talking uh, about her plans for the future of the book. So without further ado, Mel, I'm going to uh, let you unmute yourself and take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. OK, cool. So uh, yeah, so I created a open textbook with my community and justice service students last winter. And I've titled my presentation, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. It was my first time ever creating a textbook with students. And it came with a lot of good and a lot of challenge, too. So, um, so the good, this is a textbook that the students were told that they needed to buy for this course. So um, I was pleased to see that this $90 textbook is now on sale on Amazon for $75. Um, however, um, I brought the textbook into my class to show my students this is the textbook that they would uh, normally need to purchase for the course. And I had them look through the textbook and then I had them go on the computer and I had them see if they could find any of that information on the internet alone just on the internet. So for report writing, just in case anyone is wondering what that is in community services, it's things like serious occurrence reports, intake interviews, um, resumes, they go over that kind of stuff. So all of these things you can find online, you do not need a textbook. And this textbook was very bare bones considering it was a $90 textbook. So what was born of this was the students, we, we worked together to create our own textbook based on the types of documents that they would see in the uh, corrections field. Uh, specifically, more and more of my students are going into corrections uh, rather than just community services. So we worked within Pressbooks with the help of eCampus Ontario to put together um, a Pressbook site for our, our textbook, our open textbook. So here's the bad and the ugly. Um, Pressbooks at the time only would allow one author to be working on a chapter at once. And I didn't know this, so this was a learning curve for me and also for my students who kept trying to get on and then kicking out the other author that was working on the chapter and thus uh, causing the student to lose all the work that they were working on within the chapter. So that was a little bit of a, a pain point. Um, we had login errors for whatever reason, um, and 
oftentimes we would cause an overload. My 24 students all trying to get on the Pressbook site at once would cause it to uh, give error messages and it would crash the site. Um, anyone who was at test kind of saw this happen when we tried to do this with 200 plus people all in Pressbooks at once. <laughs> but um, it was a steep learning curve for the students as well to work within Pressbooks, especially for the ones who didn't have any experience working within WordPress or any kind of technology like that. So it, it was a lot of um, teaching just how to use the technology itself as well as, you know, teaching them about what we would include in the textbook and how we would include that. Um, but needless to say, this was a really great experience for my students. They really, uh, they really owned the fact that they were the ones who authored this textbook. Um, in fact, my first year students that I have now were, are told quite frequently, that textbook that you use right now, we wrote that. Like, they really own it. And then when I told my students this year that um, they will be looking at editing it, adding to it if there's things that they felt were missing, the students now come back and say, yeah, but I'm going to edit your work. Like they, so there's a lot of ownership. And the thing about this textbook is um, I like the idea or I, I brought the idea to the students about creating it because they will see these documents in the field that they're going into. So when they leave school, it's going to have that longevity. So if they're like, how do I do a funding proposal again? They can go to the textbook and they can, they can go through the chapter and learn how to do that. Um, another lesson learned was um, what I would probably end up doing um, if I was ever having students write a textbook again is I would have them work collaboratively in Google Docs first, really hone out their chapter, add feedback, make sure that they have like a, a complete good copy ready to go, and then have one of them upload the stuff to Pressbooks just because it was a... Uh, um, it was a little bit frustrating to try to work just within Pressbooks with like a whole group of students. However, um, I think that going forward, I would have them work in a collaborative document. And the cool thing about this is for the future is that we can add more chapters. So if there are other documents that, you know, our, our professional advisory committee is telling us like the students are coming and they don't know this document, we can add it into this book. And um, we actually have, there's a couple of faculty in the program now that when they refer to any of these documents, they're like, if you forget how to do this, go back to the textbook that you guys wrote. Or So even faculty within the program are starting to refer to the textbook. So um, it's been a great learning experience altogether. So I would, I would recommend it. It was a good challenge, but it was worthwhile. So that's it. That's it for me. Thanks so much, Mel. I really appreciate uh, your thoughts and, and uh, your good, bad, and ugly and outcomes <laughs> and strangeness of, of writing a, a collaborative book in, in the press books. Um, so we're going to move on to our, our next presenter, but I do want to just make sure everybody knows that we have a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can ask your questions for Mel, uh, and Mel, you can either answer them uh, while other folks are uh, presenting or we can uh, answer them all at the end. Um, this is really meant to be a, as discussion based as we can can make, you know, 35, 40 people in a room uh, it, that's a virtual room uh, have. So I uh, would really appreciate if you guys, I'm sure, have questions um, if you put them in the Q&A. All right. Um, there you go. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Um, so as we, uh, Cameron gets set up, Cameron is going to be our next presenter. I'm going to tell you a bit of, uh, guys a little bit about uh, Cameron. So um, Cameron is a fourth year student at the University of Guelph who is pursuing uh, an honors uh, bachelor's degree in biological sciences with a major in biomedical sciences. Wow. Um, he also has a lot of leadership work that he is doing outside of his academic. He's, he's on the board of governors. He does Relay for Life. He's on the University of Guelph Senate, and he is a peer helper for writing services. Um, so he also is a tour guide for the university and a team leader for orientation week uh, because he's very passionate about providing students with a wholesome and welcoming environment at the University of Guelph. Um, so Wow. Uh, he, he's also really passionate about consulting with students about accessibility for educational resources on their, their campus. And all of these experiences, in addition to 
his academic background uh, are going to make him a key player in making education accessible to everybody. And Cameron, uh, when you unmute yourself, will be talking about the importance of student involvement in creating open educational resources. So thank you so much, Cameron, and we're really excited to hear from you. Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Oh, let's see, it's buffering slightly. Uh, yep. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, so I don't know. I don't have any background slides or anything like that to show everyone until a little bit later. Um, so my goal today is kind of talk about three things. Uh, the first one is how do students benefit from having open educational resources in their classrooms? Second thing is about why it is so important to bring student consultation into creating these open educational resources. And then the last one is talking about my personal experience and what I gained from creating the open educational resources. Um, so the first one, um, which is uh, what do students in the course gain from it? Mel did an absolutely amazing job of talking about the process of creating an open education. Yeah, just give me a thumbs up. <laughs> open educational resource. Um, so I'm kind of going to skim that a little bit more because I really want to focus on um, the student consultation, that student perspective. Um, so she did a great job of talking about the finances. I can tell you as a student, if you have one chapter to read, you're, you don't really want to buy a $200, $90 textbook. So having something that uh, can easily be distributed is a lot of help to students. But another aspect that I really want to focus on, um, Guelph has been shifting more towards, progressively shifting more towards um, application learning and less towards memorization learning. And I'm sure a lot of professors can attest to that. Um, and everyone in really the work, uh, the work field is that um, that's really what you're going to be seeing. It's less so memorizing, regurgitating information, it's more application. But when you shift to that style of uh, testing, that's where it comes more imperative to have supplementary learning and supplementary resources for students. Because, you know, what I find in a lot of my classes is different students learn different ways. So I know for me, I learn, I'm visual, I learn best from a diagram. You can give me a diagram, I'll look at it, I'll understand it, and I'm good to go from there for the test. But a lot of my friends really like written. They need point by point exactly what's happening in the diagram. So we just have two very different styles of learning. And as a professor, it is very difficult to cater to every single student. It's probably impossible to cater to every single student in your class. But what we can do as educators is we can have these supplementary resources in place that are free so that students can kind of um, take their education into their own hands and can look up these resources. So that's, what, that's basically what students can get out of it is they can actually really benefit um, in their education from having these supplementary resources. Now kind of moving into what, uh, like why is it so important to bring student consultation into creating open educational resources? Um, well, to be honest, students just know best. Like we're the ones that are taking the courses. We're the ones in the course who've taken it before. So we know kind of the gaps in what students aren't understanding in the courses. Um, so that's mainly the big thing behind it. I know when I sat down with our group um, to create this um, open education resource for human physiology, uh, we basically sat down for our first meeting and we all just kind of spitballed ideas of what we thought was super difficult in the course. And there was a lot of them. It is a very difficult course. Um, so we all just kind of started talking about things. Um, so everyone is making notes, um, just kind of figuring out what we had difficulty with. And then that's what we decided to focus on throughout the rest of the semester is kind of, we call them sticky points, are these sticky points of what we struggled with, and then we could address those. So that's mainly what we focused on for our textbook as well as difficult. So that means when students take this course, uh, future students take this course, then they have resources to supplement some of these more difficult concepts. So that's what I really wanted to focus on for why it's so important to bring students into creating these open educational resources, because, you know, let's face it, they know best. And at the same time, you as professors, you're super busy. You don't have a lot of time to sit down for hours on end creating these open educational resources as much as you would love to. So bringing students into this will help you as well as help students. Bringing to my last point of uh, what did I gain from uh, creating open educational resources, the first one is um, being comfortable with uncertainty. Um, this for me uh, and for a lot of students, because a lot of us are in like biomedical science, human connects and everything, we're used to having our course structure being standardized. They tell you, they have a rubric and they tell you exactly what they want to see. Two points for stating this sentence, you know, and that's basically what we like because then we know what we need to do to get full marks. So what this course really taught us, because I'll give you the structure of it, we basically sat down um, and they said, here's what past students are doing um, and have done, go. 
that was it. <laughs> That's all we really had for a structure of it. Um, and what we really had to do was get really comfortable with uncertainty and not knowing what direction we want to take with the course. I can tell you at first we hated it. We didn't like not having that structure, but then doing a lot of our reflection assignments, looking back at it, we actually saw that our project actually started to get better because we could take it in any direction that we wanted to. So the creativity aspect was so important. And this is something, of course, doing our reflection assignments as well. That was so important. When you're in the workforce, no one gives you a description of exactly what they want to see in all your projects. They basically say, here's an assignment and go. <laughs> uh, that's basically what you see a lot of the time. Um, so that's something that you can't teach in a lecture. Um, you can't teach that. This is something that you really have to create an experiential learning experience for students um, because you can't teach them a lecture of how to be comfortable with uncertainty and how to kind of be creative and take things into your own, uh, on your own path. The last thing that I kind of want to talk about is teaching. Um, when we were doing our final presentations, a lot of people talked about how they wanted to be educators, regardless of the field. A lot of people want to be physicians. A lot of people want to be like high school, elementary school teachers, anything like that, or professors. Um, I already talked about how it's so important for students to have a lot of resources that cater to their own learning. Um, so uh, basically for me, that's what I kind of talked about in my reflection is that for me, like my goal is either to become a professor or I really want to go into the healthcare field. Um, but for me, I, no matter what, I want to do some form of teaching and I want to educate others. So the most powerful thing that I learned in this course is that each person learns differently. So you have to learn how to take a step back and see, okay, the students understand, aren't understanding this. What can I do to change my teaching style as well as what resources can I bring to the table in order to help these students? Um, so basically for me, I'll kind of end off that just to kind of summarize. Oh, sorry, I have one more thing actually, um, because I have a little PowerPoint thing that I'll show everyone. Um, we used a website called, can everyone see that? Can you have a thumbs up? Okay. Um, we used uh, Pressbooks um, to create. So same with Mel, we used Pressbooks. This is kind of how we got it set up. Um, Mel, I don't know if uh, you kind of knew about this before. You can't see it right now, but when you're talking, able to have every single student on at the same time is we created a sandbox. It was called a sandbox for each person. So for anyone that's using Pressbooks, if you want everyone to have access to it all at the same time, you create a sandbox for each individual student in your class. Then they all edit on their individual sandbox. And then at the end of the semester, we put everything all into one specific sandbox and one specific textbook. Um, so that's how kind of how we got around that. Um, I'm not endorsed by Pressbook at all. <laughs> I did like using it, I'm not endorsed by it at all. Um, I just wanted to show everyone kind of what it's all about if you're thinking about creating open educational resources for your own classroom environment. Um, so my unit was specifically blood flow, heart and vasculature. Um, so that's kind of how it was set up. Um, this is kind of when you have the textbook, this is what it looks like. Um, it's very accessible um, when you're making this. So for all students, um, we kind of, this is just, you know, rough draft of everything. Um, but our goal is to put in a lot of resources, pictures and diagrams with descriptions underneath to make sure that students can understand some of the more difficult concepts uh, in the course. And the last thing I actually find is one of the most useful, um, you don't need to know the answer to this, um, is uh, basically concept of testing. Um, so we put in a lot of supplementary uh, problem solving questions and multiple choice where they actually give you the answer and show you how to do the answer afterwards. So we find having a lot of problem solving questions built into the textbook to supplement what the teacher's teaching also really, really helps students. So that's kind of the last thing that um, I wanted to go over there, not stop video. How do you do this? Do, 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 desktop one. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how you stop sharing. Oh, right there. Staring at me right in the face. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the last thing I want to talk about. So thank you everyone for uh, listening to me talk there. Hopefully that wasn't too long because I do want to make sure we have time to answer questions at the end. Um, yeah, awesome. Great. Thank you so, so much, Cameron, um, for so many of your wonderful observations. Um, just for the folks that are not in Ontario, uh, in Ontario, every educator does have access to Pressbooks uh, edu for education um, provided through eCampus Ontario. Um, so we have a, no a number of licenses and that's why you'll see a lot of these projects being done uh, on, on Pressbooks. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I will go on to our last presenter, uh, who is Jordan. And Jordan, while you set up your screen, I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you. <laughs>
so Jordana is a faculty member in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies at Durham College, and she's also a former uh, educational developer for the Center uh, for Academic and Faculty Enrichment. Um, so she has expertise in online and hybrid learning. She's really committed to the design and delivery of engaging and rich online uh, learning experiences, and she's got a whole broad range of experience um, developing, facilitating, web-based courses, hybrid courses, fully online courses at the post-secondary level. Um, she also teaches at Ontario Tech's uh, Faculty of Education, School of Education and Technology at Royal Roads, and the Extended Education Department at the University of Manitoba, oh, and, and the School of Education at Randier College. Wow, you can take a class with Jordan almost anywhere in Canada uh, if you're really interested in learning more about education. Um, and she also has a PhD in e-research and technology enhanced learning from Lancaster University and a master's of ed in distance learning from Athabasca. Uh, and uh, Jordana is going to talk to us about some uh, the experience of creating a renewable assignment uh, using uh, Pressbooks where students contributed uh, to, you know what, I'll just let her tell you about beer throughout the ages. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lillian. Um, so yeah, uh, after you hear that background, you're probably wondering uh, why I'm creating an open textbook about beer, um, aside from the fact that it's one of my favorite topics. Um, but just to let you know, um, I am teaching. So um, as Lillian mentioned, I'm a faculty member in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies at Durham College. And so I recently created a new uh, general education course about beer through the ages. So it is a legitimate uh, course uh, where we look at the the history of beer, um, starting from the ancient origins uh, all the way to the contemporary uh, age that we're in now with uh, craft beer and microbreweries. So um, this is a course that I just uh, developed uh, starting in the fall of 2019. Um, so when I was developing the course, um, I was trying to think about different ways that I could encourage uh, student involvement. So, you know, listening to Cameron's experience, you know, finding ways to have students be involved. Um, and I was really inspired by uh, the work by David Wiley. So this idea of sort of the disposable versus renewable assignment. So uh, Wiley had mentioned, you know, a lot of our assignments that we typically have are very disposable. You know, students submit a, an assignment, a paper in class, um, they get some feedback and then it's something that they don't typically use again. So he had suggested this idea of creating a renewable assignment. So something that students can continue to add to, they can build on each other's work, uh, hopefully make it to uh, and sort of have something that carries on beyond just the end of the course um, and I think this is really important for me because of general education um, you know sometimes it's a course it's an elective course for students so a lot of times you know after they they finish the course they don't always you know keep keep thinking about it afterwards I wanted something that would maybe you know encourage some more um, engagement beyond just the, the course itself so um, basically I was also uh, inspired by a couple of great examples so uh, the open pedagogy notebook had some really great examples that I borrowed from. Um, so one really great example was uh, a course created around American literature. And then there was a great textbook that had lots of different examples, but another one that was created out of the University of Wisconsin uh, with art history. So I kind of borrowed a few different ideas um, that uh, these faculty had used. So definitely I uh, was uh, taking the idea of open and borrowing from other open projects as well. Um, and so basically I decided to try it out and do a little bit of an experiment uh, last semester. So similar to the other folks, uh, given that Pressbooks was available for free through eCampus, uh, I decided to use that. I have used WordPress a little bit myself, so had a little bit of background knowledge and had hoped that um, it would be fairly easy for the students to use as well. Um, so just to give you a sense, uh, in the fall 2019 semester, I had two sections of the Beer Through the Ages courses. So I had 90 students uh, and ultimately there were 75 chapters that were created by the students in Pressbooks which was pretty exciting. Um, and the way it worked is I, I organized the course around the creation of the textbook. So basically, uh, each student had signed up for a beer that they were interested in, and they researched the history of the beer. And for each of the units in the course, they contributed sections to the chapter um, about uh, whatever historical component we were looking at. So they basically built on their chapter throughout the semester, um, and they had their own pages. So they weren't necessarily covering on one, they each kind of had their own that they were contributing to. Um, and then there was a peer review component. So once they had finished doing their chapters throughout the course, they had an opportunity to do some peer review, to read each other's chapters, give some feedback, 
Um, and there was also a revision loop. So as part of their assignments, they were revising their chapter each time based on feedback. Uh, and then they ultimately had a culminating assignment where they had to use each other's chapters to uh, create a final project where they pulled some of the pieces together and basically reflected and did a comparative analysis about the history of different beers across time. So, um, and at the end, I also gave them an opportunity if they wanted to make their chapter public, so have it be open um, so anyone could use it or adapt it. They had the chance to sign up an agreement form uh, where they would make their chapter available that other people could, uh, could read and it would be open um, and CC licensed. So the results, uh, what ended up happening, so ultimately, uh, 18 out of the 75 students chose to uh, sign the agreement form and make their chapter open. Uh, I was a little disappointed. I had hoped that maybe there would be more that wanted to share because there were actually some really, really great chapters that students opted not to, to publish and, and have as part of the book. Um, but the actual creation of it, I think, was a really important learning experience. Um, but if you want, you can probably like click on the link there if you want to check out a couple of the chapters. Um, so ultimately, uh, I mean, I was very impressed with the students' work that they created. Um, they were great about incorporating multimedia. Uh, one of the requirements was also to include um, the interactive elements, so the ones that Cameron showed you with the H5P. Um, they were required to add in a few knowledge checks throughout their uh, pages, so it needed a little bit more interactive um, and sort of a pretty rich resource that others could, could build on uh, and use. And to give you a sense of the feedback, kind of going to sort of Mel's the good, the bad, and the ugly, it was a mix. So I had, you know, some students that really loved, you know, using press books. Many of them hadn't had a chance to use something like that in the past, so they really liked creating their pages. They really, you know, were invested and were engaged with, you know, formatting it and uh, getting it the way they wanted. They also liked being able to review each other's and, and give feedback and also sort of build from each other's. Um, and then I also had a, a group that felt that it was way too much work, um, that especially for a gen ed, it was a little bit more than they had anticipated for the workload. Uh, and some people didn't like the idea of having to learn a new system. So they would have preferred just to have, you know, our, our regular learning management system versus, you know, trying to learn a whole new Pressbooks system. So I would say, you know, around after the first round, kind of a mix of feedback in terms of student uh, experience. So some loved it, some hated it and a few kind of in the middle as well. Um, so a couple of things similar to Mel from my end, uh, some things just logistically to figure out uh, press books, you know, managing accounts with 90 students, kind of adding people, assigning them to pages was a little bit cumbersome. Um, as it turns out, although they were, students were encouraged to use uh, open elements, some of the elements that were added to the pages uh, do not so they violate copyright. So uh, what I'm hoping to do is hopefully in the spring maybe have a couple of students actually work to find alternatives. For, so any of the images that are included that aren't uh, properly have copyright, we can maybe find some alternatives. Um, also, again, I was a little disappointed that we didn't have more students wanting to make it open. So trying to find ways to encourage students to make their final product open. Um, so the students that didn't make it open, I ended up archiving their content and giving them a copy. So Ultimately, uh, it still was disposable for some students, so I'm hoping to have it be more renewable and encourage students to have that idea of making it available and for other people to be able to, to add on to. Um, and then going forward, just thinking about how to keep, uh, you know, sustaining it. So adding more chapters and finding ways students can collaborate and build on the work that's already been done. So looking for different ways to kind of keep it going and, and see how it goes. So um, in terms of right now, I have another group of 50 students, so I'm trying it out again uh, to get a little bit more feedback just to kind of see uh, you know, how things go and then definitely look at ways to kind of tweak it. I've already got a few great ideas hearing from Cameron and Mel, so I'll probably steal uh, some ideas as I move forward as well. But that's sort of kind of my initial experiment and sort of where I'm going uh, with my project. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely excited to see uh, questions and also hear from everyone else that's had experience because I'm still definitely a work in progress and kind of trying it out and see how it goes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, Cameron, Mel, everybody, uh, thank you for uh, keeping it short but keeping it informative. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so we have some questions in the Q&A and I would encourage folks to continue to add their, their questions for uh, the Q&A. Um, there are some that have already been answered, um, but um, there are some I'd love to answer live. So um, I'm just gonna start with Kim's question. 
Kim uh, has a question for you, Cameron. How did the instructor help you through the uncertainty uh, to be more comfortable with the project? Okay, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, so I'll tell you, it was different per person. Um, so I don't know if I clarified that. There's about 16 people that were in like this research project at once. So it was a group of us um, that were tackling this. So at first they kind of just let us go and said, okay, everyone, here's your end goal. Um, sorry, they didn't even say that. They literally just said, here's the packages. You guys get as much work done as possible. Um, and it was up to us to kind of figure it out. And they judged basically how they kind of tackled it. If people weren't comfortable with the uncertainty is they waited until the students came to them. For me, I was a little bit more comfortable with it. I found because I was doing a lot so for me, I loved making my own deadlines um, and having my own set times. So for me, I was a little bit more comfortable with it, but there were certain people in the class that needed a more standardized um, style. So what, they, what the supervisor said is, here's kind of the goal. Um, they wouldn't say, because they didn't tell us that the end goal was kind of just to have us comfortable with uncertainty. They didn't tell us that until our final presentation. They said, yeah, that was really the end goal. <laughs> um, but uh, they basically just said, um, here's kind of what we want to see with the we want to have it taken and then um, if you have any questions contact us that's basically all they said they waited a student contact them and said hey i don't know what direction to take they booked a meeting with them and said okay here's kind of what past students are doing here's kind of like a guideline of what we want to see and they would answer questions along the way and kind of identify those students that may need a little and that's perfectly fine um, not saying that I'm better, like worse than like someone else. Um, but the supervisor really just kind of kept in touch with the students. We met every single week um, where students can kind of field questions to the supervisor and all the professors. Uh, but yeah, basically just to summarize everything, they kind of put that on us to kind of allow us to reach out to them when we needed help. And I found that was also really helpful because then that kind of built fourth year students. Um, it was really helpful because we have to take our learning into our own hands. Uh, but hopefully that kind of answered your question. I can field it a different way if you want as well, but hopefully that kind of helps. I have uh, one thing to add, Lillian. Um, with my students, um, I, we actually did like a written agreement of support for each other. So every student in the class um, signed over to say that they're going to put forth their best effort and that they would seek out support when needed. But then I also signed the agreement saying to them that I promise to support you throughout this entire process. And I felt like, um, I felt like that really, because my students were like, wait, you're promising to help us? Like it really got them thinking and I was like, well, yeah, like that's, but I think the signing of it, like making it super formal, like I promise you are not going to fail this assignment because I'm going to be there to support you the entire way. I think that that really helped to get buy-in um, for a majority of my students to really like take this and be like, I'm going to make this the best open textbook ever, you know? <laughs> that's really excellent, Mel. And uh, Cameron, I love, uh, that you had the big reveal at the end where the, you know you were finally told you were just getting comfortable with uncertainty uh, and Mel I love the idea of making that uncertainty a, a little less uh, scary or like a little a little less fatalist almost uh, with a written agreement. Um, speaking of written agreements um, how did you all handle this is Larry's question uh, folks giving permission to, to share their work uh, you know, were you were you asked to sign anything? Did you handle that at the beginning or the end? You know, anybody who wants to go first. I can jump in. So yeah, I did. Um, I did an agreement. I had kind of looked at what other people had done and, and looked at some different um, ideas. And so that idea of having a student agreement form seemed. Um, like a good suggestion, especially if I wanted to make it something that was open. I, again, I'm always worried about copyright and, and making sure that I respect all of that. So um, I did more of a formalized piece, but it was done at the end. So their final submission, they could attach it with their submission if they wanted to. So that could have also been why there wasn't as much uptake, the timing of things. It's an extra thing for students to, to add and submit. Um, so that may not have been the best approach. And then I'm thinking of for Mel, maybe even me having my own signing that I would agree to promise to kind of help them through it may have, may have helped as well. So I did more of a formalized process. Yeah, I can add something as well to that. Um, 
so basically for us, um, we are, so I was actually the third cohort that was coming through. Um, the other two cohorts, their role and like how far they made it was looking for solely open educational resources that could be widely distributed. So we did have resources coming in. Um, so for us, we mainly stuck to those because I found for sciences, there was a lot of resources that were accessible. Um, but another thing that I found was super helpful because I've never done this before, like as a student, had uh, Ali. So Ali is our open educational resources librarian. So she came in and she actually did a presentation of how to specifically find open educational resources. Um, Cause there's a way that you can do it on Google that solely looks um, for resources that are open. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, having her come in and kind of guide us through how to find these resources made a lot easier. And then also if we did find a really good resource that we wanted to use in the textbook, um, we would contact her and she would walk us through how to contact that person that frequently. A lot of the time, if there was one that wasn't open, um, we could find a resources that's just as good that is open. I, uh, I approached it with uh, my students right at the beginning, talking about how this, this was going to be an open source textbook. Um, one of the things that I allowed them to do, though, is if they wanted to, they could be attributed as um, they could use a pseudonym or anonymous, like they didn't have to necessarily put their name on it, um, which I think helped. Uh, I think, I think for this assignment, I didn't have any, like students are like, I'm a published author, like they wanted their name on it. So I thought that was cool. For the um, open licensing, I had the librarian come in and talk about uh, Creative Commons and what those licenses looked like. And together as a group, we decided what license we would like to uh, attribute to the open textbook. Um, I think that us, like they had to learn about what the Creative Commons was first, then I, we showed them other uh, resources and other textbooks that other students had created. Um, we, like Robin DeRosa's textbook, and um, we then showed them all these great things that students are doing, and they're making it open for other students to benefit. So I think that really helped in the beginning to get my students on board with wanting to be able to be a part of this this movement. I talked about it like a movement, like a social justice movement, and, and that really helped too. Um, and to show them that there is nothing in their field that's open like this, like they would be the first ones to do this. So I think that like a lot of those little things help um, and bringing the librarian in to um, really help show students like what Cameron said about where they can find open resources stealing pictures from Google you know so she came in and she showed them all that so it made it easier for the students um, to be able to create the chapters in a way that they felt confident um, and then they were able to choose the license for the whole textbook as a class so I think that that was uh, that's what helped anyway thanks so much everybody that was uh really thorough and like three really interesting perspectives on that. Um, and I just want to say, I, I, Karen is saying in the, ch in the chat that uh, she's an academic librarian and she's really happy to see you uh, all acknowledge the role of librarians in OERs and open pedagogy. And I see a lot of librarians in attendance. So um, hopefully you guys are getting some I ideas as well. Yes, Mel, your librarian is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Marnie is amazing. Um, okay, so we've got a couple more questions in the Q and A. Um, for uh, I think, Jordan, I think you kind of answered this, but do you think there are any other main barriers in, in students deciding not to make their chapter open at the end? Um, I think too there was some, and again, I think I'm, I'm now borrowing some of Mel's ideas to to look at some ways to encourage that. But I think too there were some that are a little apprehensive of making their work available. They weren't feeling that it was you know where they wanted to to be. I had some people that asked, you know, can I um, decide later on? Can I spend some time you know over the holidays tweaking it and fixing it before I make it available? So some of that I think was just them their comfort level of of making things available. But um, definitely I think some more strategies you know as we go. I mean we had talked about this idea of creating this collaborative resource, but maybe be kind of building it in and, and uh, having more of that um, buy in and encouraging that might have might have helped but definitely I think there were some that are a bit apprehensive about just sharing it and weren't 100% comfortable with having their, their material out there but again maybe even not having it attributed to them so using pseudonyms or um, something like that might be a good approach as well. Awesome thanks so much um, and finally Lee we have one 
Oh, we've got two more questions. One, uh, Cameron, uh, is there a link to the resource that you guys have created anywhere that we could share, or is it not there yet? Yeah, so exactly. I was looking at that in the chat there. Um, so I honestly, while I was sitting here, I just sent an email to uh, my supervisor to see. It's an ongoing process for our textbook right now. There's a cohort of students that are working on it right now. Um, we put all of our resources in and they're kind of touching it up. So hopefully, fingers crossed, um, end of this semester, if not end of next semester. Um, so I just sent her an email to see if there's anything we can do to kind of give you guys a taste of what we're working on. Um, haven't gotten a response back yet, but I don't know, Lillian, if there's any way um, like afterwards, if I do get a link, if I'm able to send it to you and you can distribute it to anyone that's kind of looking for it. Um, cause I'm sure they wouldn't mind. They would love to share, um, the textbook and kind of what we're working on. I just don't know how to do it right now. So cool. Absolutely. So, um, this is a little shameless plug for our open library. Anything that you guys create anywhere that is open and openly licensed can be deposited in the eCampus Ontario open library for uh, discovery and adaptation provided that it has some uh, adaptable files and an open license and is accessible. Um, so I will, you know, hopefully uh, bother you and your professor to get your resource once it's completed into our open library. Um, and there will be an email that goes out to everybody that was registered for uh, this webinar with a link to the collaborative notes, a link to the webinar recording, and sort of any other um, resources that you would want to share, if you want to share slides, uh, you feel that like that would be helpful. Um, so we'll send that out in a few days as well. And uh, Cameron, if you get something back, we'd love to, to share it. If not, um, we'll make sure when it is ready for sharing that uh, it gets a lot of attention from our, our open library. Um, and Kim Carter is saying that uh, the uh, images that you've uh, found for your, your research, Cameron, might be really helpful for uh, medical terminology OER that is currently in, um, in development. I think Kim is you know, being a little coy because she's developing it. <laughs> so um, maybe you all might uh, want to connect uh, with, with, with her as well. Um, and finally, one question from Trisha, who is finalizing a lit review and a presentation for Open Ed Week. Uh, which is my next shameless plug that I'm going to give. Um, some of the information uh, that we provided in today's webinar would be relevant uh, to what she's sharing. Uh, can we all get a verbal confirmation that you guys are comfortable uh, having your experiences referenced? <laughs> okay, we're getting, we're getting three thumbs up. All right, answered live. Done. Okay, so it's at 12.45. My goal is to, uh, if there are no other questions, to get you all on your way with 10 minutes to spare for your next meeting. But first, um, a little bit of, well, it's not really housekeeping, but a little shameless uh, you know, plug for things that are coming on at eCampus Ontario in the future uh, while we, we have you. Um, usually we do these webinars every uh, month, but this month I'd like you to save the date for Open Education Week. Uh, we're not gonna bother you with a webinar the week after, but we will have a couple of events going on at eCampus Ontario. Um, that will be announced very shortly. When they are announced, they will be included in this Open Education Week uh, 2020 calendar. Um, and I would encourage those of you who are running events on your campus to please uh, submit those events to the global calendar by, uh, created by Open Education Global so that other folks might discover them and get some ideas as well. Uh, we will be having a presentation uh, with our Open Education Fellows uh, with a registration link, date and time description available shortly. We will also be having some sort of webinar on H5P, which was talked about a lot in, uh, in this particular uh, panel. So um, if you wanna learn more about H5P, keep an eye out for that as well. Um, and finally, uh, oops. We are doing a little campaign right now to reach $10 million in student savings. So as Mel and Cameron talked about, saving money with OER is, is a huge uh, motivator for that. We are so close. We're about $9.3 million in savings for students in Ontario. If you have adopted an open resource or you've created an open resource with your students uh, that has supplemented the cost of a commercial textbook, please let us know. Uh, anybody who lets us know, I was gonna do a costume change, but I ran out of time, is eligible to win some uh, eCampus Ontario limited edition, read we only have a few of them left, swag. Uh, so here is a beautiful hoodie. Uh, here are socks that I found in my desk. Um, there are other things 
that are on the docket. So if you submit your adoption report before March 6th, you'll be entered into a draw to win uh, some eCampus Ontario branded items. Um, so please do. And lastly, um, this webinar is part of the Ontario Open Library Network, which is a community-based uh, project. It uh, doesn't exist without you. It's a space for anybody in Ontario or interested in what's going on in Ontario uh, to connect. Um, so we couldn't do this without you. We're really appreciative for all of you. If you haven't uh, joined our Slack channel, please do. Uh, uh, it's where you can keep on top of what's going on and connect with other folks uh, who are interested in this work. We have a Slack channel specifically for open pedagogy related work if you want to share I or exchange ideas. Um, and because of that, we'll be taking you to a very brief survey when this webinar is over, just about your opinions on the webinar, what you'd like to see us run in the future so that we can continue to make this relevant and exciting for you. All right, uh, and that's all I have for all of you. Um, thank you all once again so, so much uh, for being a part of this and for being here today. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. I, I learned quite a lot. Um, and we'll see you at the next one.